Hello there, this is Dave King DDS again. We're going to go ahead and do another review of the Serex software for um, a basic introduction to how this um, taskbar up at the top works. Um, the control bar you have up here in the software. So we're going to talk through a few of these things. We're going to look at configuration. Um, the last video we talked about a basic setup um, of a crown or a bridge. So we're going to go ahead and just do a very generic discussion about the software in particular. Um, this is your landing page. As I demonstrated before, um, I like to use the screen maximized, the software maximized. I just think it looks a lot cleaner. Now sometimes if we have a case going on and something milling and we need to get another case opened up, um, how do you get to add another Serret case without closing the other one? Um, well, the way that we do that is to go to window mode. So that brings back the uh, bars up on the top. And you can see I can grab it and drag it around. If I drag it up to the top, it'll maximize it to fit the screen, but it doesn't take away these control bars here. Um, so to do that, you want to maximize like that. But to get out of there, we're going to select this window mode, which will minimize. And then at that point, if I want to add another Serex screen, um, I go to the start menu and go ahead and click this again and then we'll get another um, window of Serec open. And at that point I can start another case. Um, but one thing to be aware of, if you haven't imaged yet, if you've set the program up um, and you've identified we're doing a crown or veneer, an inlay or onlay, um, and you have not taken the images yet, then the camera itself is kind of locked to that one particular uh, case. You can't start another case without moving past the imaging of the first case that you started. So what I'd suggest is you can open up both the windows, um, but I wouldn't set up that second case or third or fourth until you've gone past the imaging for the first case. Um, usually in my practice, we will go ahead and start a Serec crown or veneer or whatever, um, and then we'll get it milling, and then we've got another patient, so the assistants will wipe the machine down, they'll open up another incidence of the Serex software, and then we'll start that other patient while the first unit uh, is milling. Um, so that's not usually an issue. I'm gonna go ahead and maximize this back up again, and let's talk about what's up here. So start screen, if I had a case in use, um, if I clicked on this start screen, then it would take me back um, to this screen that you see here, this screen here. Um, and you'll notice there are two ways to get up to that control bar up here. You drag it all the way to the top and just hold it against the top, or you can use the arrow right there. Just click on the arrow and it, it pulls this up. So this, I should clarify, is software version 4.4. .4. Um, we have not updated to 4.5 yet. It is out there. I understand there are a few bugs, um, but we haven't quite updated. I'm looking forward to trying that out. So start screen. This is if you're already in a case. Um, save. Um, this is a really important feature that I think a lot of us don't use enough. Um, when you start to do big cases, and I'm talking about multiple crowns, multiple veneers, multiple inlays, inlays onlays, or, or a single bridge, um, I like to use this after I've done any, you know, uh, kind of a majority of editing. I like to hit save. And the reason I like to use that is if I've had the software crash, it usually happens after I've done all the fine tune editing. Um, and then I lose everything back to the images. I've never lost the images, um, but if the software crashes and I have to force close it, um, which hasn't happened very recently, um, then I wanna make sure I've saved all my edits going forward. So I would suggest that once you've done, um, if you're working on multiple units, once you've done any number of edits, whether it's you know do doing a bunch of shaping, a bunch of recontouring, then roll up here, hit save. Now you notice I can't select it here. Um, so the save as is, you know, self-explanatory. If you want to save the case as a different, um, under a different name, um, you can certainly do that. Um, save it under a different name, change some of the settings. Um, import, now if I've got a case, uh, for instance, that I brought from another Serec machine or that I'm helping someone else out and they've emailed it to me and I've downloaded it, I can use this import. I can also, if I have it on the desktop or in a thumb drive, I can just double click on it and it will automatically, usually automatically open the software. So that's what that uh, import is for. Now export, if I've already designed, excuse me, if I've already designed 
a restoration or a profile or a, you know a set of crowns or something I can export that now the nice thing is I understand it is the different versions of the software in 4.5 will allow you to export it as more than just an RST um, so we can actually import it into a 3d printer machine to uh, print uh, and what have you um, this is uh, not something that we use very often unless there are those of us that are doing some 3d printing or creating some guides or um, you know basically using some 3d modalities that generally um, introductory level courses like this won't discuss so we may get to that down the road that's not something I've done a whole lot except um, if I want to do a backup or move a, a case from one machine to another, one CEREC machine to another, I'll export it, then I'll grab that file from the desktop or wherever I export it um, and put it on a thumb drive. Never use this run application. Um, again, this is designed to be used in conjunction with other software programs. Um, Serona Connect, this is a great um, feature now that we can export at any point to Serona Connect. So if you get into a case um, and you feel like this is above you, this is something that um, you can't do, um, then you can export it. Just click Serona Connect right there. It'll automatically open up the Serona Connect profile, and you can send this case out to a lab that may have you know, different um, materials available, like zirconia if you want to go that route, or just someone with a little more experience. Um, Serona Connect is, a, you know, for, for a different discussion, it's a, it's a great uh, tool. Um, I've used it a lot in the past, um, but you want to make sure you're, you're in good communication with the lab techs um, that are accepting your cases through Serona Connect. I had an incident when I was in Kansas City. I was sending um, some cases to a lab through Serona Connect because my uh, milling machine, I was using the compact milling machine, had gone down. I think I needed a new um, burr assembly or something. One of the motors had died, and so I... Uh, was sending them out to a lab. And the lab was great, did high quality work. Um, the first couple of crowns I got back, um, I, I felt like they didn't quite seat exactly right. The margins were a little bit open. I don't think it was a design issue at all. They were designed well. So I called up the lab and I asked the lab tech, what, uh, what are your um, uh, parameters set at? And he had no idea what I was talking about. And we're gonna talk about parameters here when we get to this configuration. Um, discussion here in just a second um, but the reason I'm telling you this is if you're going to be com communicating with us with a lab through Serona Connect you want to get on the phone with that lab and make sure that they use the same parameters you use their cement spacer their the film thickness you know their occlusal offset whatever it is um, is appropriate for what you want okay um, but this is great so at any point now during the, the, the process once I've imaged I can export it um, before you used to have to uh, start it in Serret Connect or you could export it and then import it into Serret Connect but now we can go straight to Serona Connect um, license manager this just manages whatever licenses and permissions we have um, for this particular machine um, and then here's our configuration I'm gonna go ahead and click on this configuration we'll dig into this a little bit so here you have five options um, let's talk about um, the parameters and devices here for this one. We may get into options and settings depending on time. Um, so let's talk about parameters. So the parameters are really important that we understand that the machine is using this set of parameters, whatever your machine is, um, to calculate whatever these restorations are. Okay, um, so I'm going to pull this up. I'm not going to change it, but I'll talk through it. Um, each of these different uh, modalities has a different parameter settings that you can change. So if I change the settings here for the crown, it's going to change the parameters for every crown I design going forward. This is a global parameter change, whatever I do on this screen when I've gone up in here to configuration. Um, whereas if I were to go and change the restoration parameters at the end of the design process, it only changes the parameters for that restoration. So let's talk through these parameters. Um, and again, if I adjust them here, you'll basically see what it looks like for all these other ones. I'm not going to touch on articulation um, or CERIC guide or preparation analysis. We're going to focus on the basics for now. So I just click on the crown. Um, we've got some presets. Um, depending on what you have, what you want to do. Um, ignore these for now. You can add these. You, know, you can add a preset. You can remove them. Um, whatever. Anyway, let's look at just the parameter settings themselves. So 
First one that pops up is spacer. You can see this is set to 120 and this is measured in microns. So this is just a little more than a tenth of a millimeter. Um, usually I like my cement or my spacer up at about 200, um, depending on what cement I'm using. Um, you can see here again, it's set at 120. Um, so I would ask you to consider before you change this, um, if you're a dental assistant, you need to ask your doctor what the, the film thickness is of their cement what is the film thickness because that will determine how much spacer you need um, if you're using a very thick viscous cement you need more spacer than if you're using a very thin runny cement and some cements flow a lot better than others um, I would encourage each doctor that's listening or the assistants to look through the packaging that comes with your cement and determine what your film thickness is because um, it'll tell you uh, what I like to use Verilink Aesthetic it's one of my favorite cements um, in conjunction with adhes and uh, hydro, uh, phosphoric acid etch. Um, I really like that combination. Um, but Verilink Aesthetic has a cement thickness, film thickness of 70 microns. So if I have it at 120, that's not even enough for two of those particles to line up. Um, so I feel like with 70 microns, I need, a, I need more space. So I drag it up to 200 when I'm using uh, uh, Verilink Aesthetic. Um, but that's, that's my preference. Um, we want to make sure that we don't have too much thickness in here. This is represented here. Too much space um, because that'll create some weak spots potentially for your restoration. But at the same time, you need to have enough space for your cement. Um, let's talk about occlusal milling offset. So this is something that's calculated after the restoration is designed. After, all the way at the very end after the restoration is designed. Um, occlusal milling offset is calculated afterwards. And as I drag this, you can see what's happening there on the top of the restoration. So at zero, there is no change to the occlusal surface of the restoration um, after you design it. Now, if on the other hand, I change this to a negative 250, um, after I design it, the machine is gonna mill 250 microns lower or closer to the prep than it would um, if I left it at zero. So you have to be cautious because this plays into the, the, the minimal thickness of your materials. If you have a nice minimal thickness, you design it to one millimeter, um, and then you have this 250 micron offset, well, your, absolute, your actual thickness of the material is gonna be 750 microns. You know, it's gonna be too thin. So you need to know what this is. Now, a lot of us build this in because we know there's gonna be a little swelling in the PDL, um, and we also know that there's gonna be a little cement film thickness hanging us up just a little bit. So there should be some offset. And I would leave this up to the practitioner. This is a discussion you need to have with your doctor if you're a dental assistant. I would not change any of these settings unless you're having problems, by the way. Leave them all alone unless you're having concerns, and then you need to get probably with a CEREC specialist before you start changing any of these settings. The next three, these contacts um, are only in the proposal phase. So what I mean is once you get a design proposal, that's where these numbers are calculated. If you edit them beyond that, these numbers go out the window. Um, so these are only for proposal purposes. Like I said, if you edit them beyond that, these go out the window. Um, so this is only for the initial proposal. Um, I like, uh, I've kind of talked through this before, I like a little bit of red on an Emacs, just a very hint of red or a lot of yellow. Um, some of the other restorations, um, depending on the softness, the thickness of the, or the, the hardness of the material, I can do a little more red. But the way I polish, I find that just a hint of red and a lot of yellow on the Emacs restorations works really well. Um, but these are usually edited after the fact. We almost always edit these in our design process. So I would leave these alone as well. Let's talk about minimal thickness. Now this depends entirely on the indication in the mouth where you are, um, what you're bonding to, enamel or dentin, um, and also the strength of the materials. And there are study after study after study that you can refer to um, to get an idea, feel for what um, the strength of the material is and what the absolute minimal thickness is. I know Ivoclar just came out and told us so with our Emacs restorations we can now go to one millimeter in thickness if it's adhesively bonded and you have a nice rounded prep. If you have sharp edges that all goes out the window. Um, so I normally keep mine at, at one millimeter um, so that I've got, I know, I've, I know exactly where I'm at and then I always try to prep 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters off the occlusal surface, and usually it's perfectly fine. A minimal thickness radial, again, this depends on where you're at in the mouth, what your prep design is, and what the material you're using is. Um, defaults to 700, again, I would not change these. Um, and then your margin thickness, 
this uh, demonstrates how thick your margin is. If you've got um, some heavy-handed polishing going on, I would make a little bit thicker margin so that when you polish that area, you're not cutting back into the tooth. Um, but don't make it too big because then you're going to have some issues with you know food impaction um, and some gingivitis from a margin that's too wide. Um, but that's that's a nice feature um, that allows us to compensate for some over polishing. So um, real quick whirlwind tour of the presets um, on the parameters. And again, if you change it here, this is a global change going forward. You can always get back to this and unchange it if you want to. Um, I'm going to hit cancel rather than OK, which would save it. I'm going to hit cancel. Um, and then I'm going to exit this screen. Let's go back to where we were um, in the uh, settings. Nope, wrong. Um, in parameters. Um, we just talked about crown, but all of these, you can change the parameters settings for all of these. Um, we just talked about crown. Basically, it's the same for each one of these. Different discussion for a different day. Thanks for watching. We'll get you in another video.